but ultimately we can't do anything without DFO's approval. Like Tonight, witnesses defend the East Coast Elver fishery after the feds shut it down. The project is just simply in the wrong place. Back to square one on the legal battle over a proposed Yukon mine. I think this gives um, everyone a chance to like really look at the issues and just look at them, like not be afraid to like talk about these things. And a new play in Winnipeg shines a light on the search for missing Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people. Good evening, I'm Savannah Kelly. Welcome to APTN National News. Witnesses testified at the Fisheries and Oceans Parliamentary Committee on Tuesday. The topic was how to prevent violence during the 2024 Elver fishing season. But the tone of discussions were about the mismanagement of the industry by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. DFO closed the Elver fishery season earlier this month. Elvers or baby eels can fetch up to $5,000 a kilogram. Stanley King is the spokesperson for the Canadian Committee for a Sustainable Fishery. He says the elver stock is not at risk and the closure cost 1,100 jobs. Meanwhile, 26 people have been arrested for unauthorized harvesting of elvers in Nova Scotia. King testified DFO will not consult with industry experts and that he has met with First Nations to save the fishery. So um, we have tried to circumvent DFO by contacting the Assembly of First Nation Chiefs ourselves. We've met with them. We've had uh, really great discussions. But ultimately, we can't do anything without DFO's approval. Like DFO is the governing body. So although we've tried and uh, the First Nations are willing to try, the license holders are willing to try, DFO is not willing to put us in a room together because, you know, it might just reveal too much of uh, what they've been doing or what they haven't been doing. There's been a new development on a legal battle surrounding BMC Minerals' proposed Kudzakea mine on Casca traditional territory in southeast Yukon. Here's Sarah Connors with the latest. In January, Yukon Supreme Court ruled the territorial and federal governments mostly upheld their duty to consult with the Casca Nation when allowing BMC Minerals' proposed Kutsakaya mining project to proceed to the next stage in the approval process. But in February, the court ordered the governments to have a consultation meeting with the Casca and reissue a decision on whether or not the mine should proceed. That meeting has happened and the governments have released a revised decision. The new decision guarantees a water treatment plant and more input on managing an access road. It also proposes a project agreement between the governments and the Casca. The agreement would provide direction on how all parties could work together through the life of the project. But Chief Dylan Loblaw of the Ross River Dinner Council says no revisions or modifications in the decision document can change one simple fact. The project is just simply in the wrong place. And we feel that a mine of that size and magnitude in a core caribou refuge shouldn't be shouldn't be uh, designed and built at this time. Back in February, the Casca Nation appealed the Territory Supreme Court's original decision that the Crown upheld its duty to consult with the Casca on the mine, among other things. Chief Loblaw says the Casca will continue with their appeal. The proposed mine's owners say they're confident they can meet all of the requirements of the revised decision document, and they'll continue to engage with the Casca. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. It's not-for-profits who are stepping up to help the most vulnerable in one of Canada's coldest cities. Our reporter Charlotte Moritz-Jacobs shadowed one program helping to close the gap to keep Yellowknife Street-involved population safe. Here's that story. Sandwiches. It's more than just a hot dog and a drink. For those who will soon enjoy this warm meal, it's a gesture of care and compassion. Our budget's very low. We do go get snacks. Salvation Armies, we, because of their bread, they've had so much donated. Um, 
we've gone there to get some bread. So we do try to eliminate the funding. Program manager of the street outreach van, Kim Robinson, is helping prep for the afternoon drive. She's been with the Yellowknife Women's Society since 2018 and says they've expanded from delivering snacks to 25 full meals a day, thanks to Food Rescue, an organization collecting and distributing unwanted food from local grocers. The van operates from 10 a.m. until 10 p.m., seven days a week, with eight staff. Along with the food, they provide safe rides to the shelter, to and from doctor's appointments, and more for the street-involved population. People, we just drive around. Um, we do have clients that do hang out Walmart, Tim Hortons area, um, because they stay in tents. They prefer to do that than have to deal with the shelters. Um, so we will go to them first, and then we'll head over to the day shelter and let the clients know that we do have snacks if they're interested. So. I'm looking for anyone who might flag us down, and I'm looking for anyone who might be staggering or sitting or laying on the ground. Street Outreach launched in 2017 with a few volunteers, but they were quickly able to reduce the frequency of RCMP responding to non-emergency calls. This resulted in less people going to the drunk tank and more folks being dropped off at okay. the sobering center. Yeah. Now staff serve up to 75 clients a day, and they're trained in trauma-informed approaches de-escalation tactics and mental health first aid. I reached out to some of the businesses just to explain to them the ins and outs. We, if you call and say that there's a fight, we don't deal with that. Um, but if you call the RCMP or we call the RCMP and we'll meet them there and um, try to de-escalate. Once that's done, then we can put them in the van. So. The organization is on the hunt for funding. While the city provides $360,000 annually, They've also proposed to allocate millions of federal dollars from the Reaching Home funding over the next two years. This would include the purchase of a new street outreach van. And they're in desperate need. During a cold snap, their only vehicle broke down. Fortunately, a resident donated a newer used van, so they retired their old broken one. But long term, YK Women's Society is hoping to expand services to include harm reduction and a medic. With the, with the medic, if they're passed out or they can't get up, we have to call the EMS, uh, have them assessed, yeah. and then if once they approve it, we can take them to the sobering center or, the, or to the day shelter. But you have to call? We have to call. the. They won't take them unless they've been assessed. A benefits concert for street outreach is being organized by volunteers next month in the capital city. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, ABTN National News, Yellowknife. We want to hear what you think about this initiative or any other story you see here tonight. Here's how to continue the conversation. If you have a story you want to share, send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read and watch our stories, go to aptnnews.ca. You can find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X. Follow ABTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. After the break, we'll tell you about a Cree entrepreneur who made space for Indigenous artists to sell their creations. Stick around.
Welcome back to ABTN National News. Up the River is a Cree-owned business located in the upper level of the Kingsway Mall in Edmonton. With business booming, they just relocated to a larger storefront. ABTN's Chris Stewart spoke to owner Clinton Desjardins on what makes his store special. In 2022, Clinton Desjardins opened a kiosk in Edmonton's Kingsway Mall, mostly selling stickers he designed himself. Those funny stickers really took off, and he opened a full retail store selling the stickers and a lot more. He started renting space to other indigenous creators to sell their handmade goods. Now, last week, he reopened in his larger space to make room for all this new stock. What we have here is uh, just a bigger space to bring in more um, indigenous artisans to sell their products on a, on a, uh, on a bigger level. Um, all year round rather than uh, uh, from home or two day weekend uh, at the uh, at the uh, farmers markets you know uh, so we're open 364 days a year and unique. creators making handmade items from across Edmonton Alberta and beyond we have, uh, we have over uh, 50 vendors uh, that uh, with their products, all handmade products uh, that range from uh, the uh, beaded earrings to uh, medicinal salves to uh, ribbon skirts, ribbon shirts, uh, uh, coffee mugs, toques, uh, license plates. A tarot card reader has been a big hit with customers. Once she opened up in my old store, uh, she was busy nonstop every day whether it be in the store or by phone, uh, but it's been uh, amazing. The Korean entrepreneur says even with all the products here, he is looking for more vendors to join with the added space. He says that ribbon skirts are big sellers as well as the stickers he designed. With the stickers, the, uh, the best sellers are the funny ones uh, and uh, the communities because I have uh, Probably about 150 uh, native communities, reserves, uh, towns, uh, uh, the territories. And people are really surprised when they come in and see uh, straight out of the Yukon or um, straight out of Bechico, straight out of East Prairie, straight out of Big River, Saskatchewan. Uh, and they really, uh, they really like it. Up the River has an open house on March 22nd and will feature drumming, jigging, singers and dancers. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. A drive along Highway 400 coming out of Toronto is anything but a carefree highway. But momentum is mounting to have the name change to honour a local legend and Canadian icon. CTV's Catalina Gillies has the story. A petition to rename Highway 400 to honor local legend Gordon Lightfoot is gaining major traction online. It's good, good to reminisce about Gordon, but I think we should try and do something for him. He's a genius. He's internationally known. He's an icon, not just in Aurelia, but, but in Canada. Aurelia native Douglas Walkinshaw came up with the idea for the Gordon Lightfoot Memorial Highway as a way to honor the icon. The petition has only been up for a few weeks and has already gained more than 13,000 signatures. Lo and behold, in one day there was like a thousand signatures and three days there were 8,000. I couldn't believe it. I thought this thing isn't going to fly. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I was so wrong. Walkinshaw says he's hoping for the stretch from the start of the 400 in Toronto until the cutoff at Highway 11 to be renamed, which is right by the exit to Lightfoot's hometown, Aurelia. Because he spent so much time between Toronto and Aurelia, I think what better way to honor his memory. Organizers of the Lightfoot Days Music Festival, John Winchester and Daphne Mainprize are also on board with the idea. It's kind of fun because the Highway 400 will bring people all the way up the highway to Aurelia and they will get to enjoy the Lightfoot Days Festival. Winchester says they are in full swing planning the festival which takes place in November. Another ode to the Canadian icon. So many people know what Gordon Lightfoot's music means to the history and culture of this country. Walkinshaw says he plans to keep the petition open for another month or two in hopes of gathering a few thousand more signatures. He then plans to take the petition to the provincial government. Catalina Gilly, CTV News, Barrie. 
A new film about a land defender devoted to stopping the Trans Mountain Pipeline is premiering in Vancouver. We'll tell you more about that after this final break. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Usually you spot these rocking in the treetops all day long, but Vivian McDonald found this one sitting on the ground, a sign that spring is just around the corner. Thanks for sharing that picture, Vivian. We'd like to see what spring brings in your territory, so send those pictures to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Over on the East Coast, five degrees for St. John's and plus four for Charlottetown. Nain, minus six and sunny, Kujuac, zero degrees in the snow. Val d'Or, minus 11 there, Montreal, minus three. Peterborough, sunshine and minus three there, North Bay, minus five. Capus Casing, minus nine and mostly sunny there, Wawa, minus seven. Churchill, snowy and minus 20 there, God's Lake, minus 10. Princess Harbor, Sunshine and minus 12, Dauphin, minus 7. Saskatoon, mix of sun and cloud, nine minus 9 degrees there, Regina, minus 6. Stony Rapids, Sunshine and minus 18, Meadow Lake, minus 6. Sunshine and minus 15 for Fort Chip, minus 6 in Fort McMurray. Red Deer, Snowy and minus 5, Medicine Hat, minus 8. Campbell River, plus 11 there, Bella Coola, plus 13. Minus six for Fort Nelson and eight degrees for Smithers. Watson Lake, snowy and minus four, Beaver Creek, plus three. Wrigley, sunshine and minus 10, Fort Simpson, minus eight. Polituck, sunshine, minus 17, Anuvik, minus 10. Baker Lake, minus 26, now yet minus 20. Aglulik, minus 27 in sunshine and Iqaluit, minus 12.
This past weekend, the second annual T and Bannock Cup was held in Ottawa, where the reigning champions held on to their title this year. The game was held at the University of Ottawa's Minto Sports Complex. Teams from Inuit Taparit Kanatami and the Métis National Council faced off against each other in a competitive but friendly game. The Métis National Council beat ITK 8-4, with ITK President Natan Obed handing MNC President Cassidy Karen this year's trophy. The Tea and Bannock Cup was created to celebrate collaboration between national Indigenous organizations. A new play in Winnipeg called Rise Red River is bringing attention to Drag the Red, an organization that searches the waterway for missing and murdered women, girls, and two-spirit people. Written and directed by Tara Bagan, the play is set in the future. It follows She, a matriarch who encounters ancestors while searching the Red River for a missing loved one. Drag the Red inspired the play. The volunteer group was established after the body of First Nations teenager Tina Fontaine was found in the Red River in 2014. The trilingual play is performed in Anishina Bemowin, English and French. Actor Tracy Nipanak, who plays the lead character, says the play generates needed community dialogue. I, I've, I've heard people talking about the play already and you know it's that's that's what we want is to talk about things that you know like we have this thing called drag the red like we should be talking about that we should you know the the protests going on at um, you know about like searching the landfill nobody wants to talk about these things so so I think this gives um, everyone a chance to like really look at the issues and just look at them like not be afraid to like talk about these things a new film about a land defender who has devoted his life to trying to stop the Trans Mountain Pipeline is premiering in Vancouver, and APTN's Tina House has this story. Industries right on top of our water systems, right? And here we have our most holiest, holiest waterways we have when our ancestors paddled through this water, and it's just uh, pretty incredible to you know, to come down to this water and, you know, make that connection that, you know, we've always had. And right across the inlet from the Slewa Tooth Nation is the Westridge Dock in Burnaby, which would carry over a million barrels of bitumen through the twinning of the Trans Mountain Pipeline that connects the oil sands in Alberta to the Pacific Ocean. The bitumen would then be loaded onto super tankers to be taken overseas to Asian markets. Will George has dedicated the last decade of his life to defending the land from the impending completion of that pipeline project. George says it's not a matter of if, but when a major spill will happen along these shorelines. Bitumen is, it sinks to the bottom, you cannot recover it. So there's lots of facades, you look in um, their spill response um, vessels all along the coast. Um, that's a facade. People think, oh, okay, look at they're, they're, they have these vessels, they have a plan, but it, uh, it's, it's a facade, it's a lie, and it's, it's, again, it's sinister because you cannot clean this up. It will sink to the bottom, and that's the threat that proposes to our, our sailor seas. George acknowledges that there are many First Nations that have signed benefit agreements along the route, but he says what's at stake is more important than money. You know, there's a lot of emotions that tie it into it. Again, we find artifacts on this beach. This is uh, our holiest territories we have left. And then for that government to continue to plow through our, our territories and create that divide amongst our people for our resource extractions. And then um, it's, it's been a challenge, but, you know, being here, and uh, it's, it's always a blessing. It's always heartwarming to be, to be here and do this work and, and you know, uh, to share that message that that threat is right there. George has just completed a film called Warrior Spirit, and it's about his journey as a land protector. I caught fish for my nation. The fish, this land, is everything to my people. I was on the water a lot, and so I saw firsthand how my home was changing. The Broad Inlet, the sacred waters where my people have harvested salmon for thousands of years, is getting busier every day. There are tankers everywhere, carrying millions of dollars of cargo. 
Um, you know, this film is, is something dear to my heart, uh, something I created, you know, over the years of, of freedom fighting, over the years of blockading, um, and that was all very necessary at the time, but, you know, being part of that, that, that cinematic history and telling the story in, in that sense is, um, is, is, is pretty incredible to be a part of, you know, to, to direct it myself, produce it, and, um, and bring this forward to my family and then, you know, a, a larger audience. And his activism work has included being suspended underneath the Second Narrows Bridge for 48 hours, along with helping build this watch house, then living in it that was along the path of the impending pipeline. He, along with his family, have been at the forefront of the resistance against TMX. And for that decade of activism, Will George has had to go to court and has even served jail time, but it's something he says is a small price to pay. Obviously, they're, they're charged with contempt of court, you know, going in these courtrooms, we know this. As Indigenous people, we know this. Our fight for survival is completely different from anyone else's. It's, it's a supernatural, beautiful coastline, uh, un, um, unique to most parts of the world. So it's, uh, it's a high honour for me to stand up and continue protecting our lands. The project was originally estimated to cost $5 billion to build, but those costs have now ballooned to $35 billion to be paid by taxpayers. Tina House, APTN National News, North Vancouver. And that's all the time we have for your midweek news. For news anytime or to catch up on stories you may have missed, visit our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Savannah Kelly, Marcy Miigwich. Thank you for joining us. Take care and have a great night.